Hi, and welcome to this edition of Fresh Hope for Mental Health. Our mission here at Fresh Hope for Mental Health is to empower you to live well in spite of your mental health challenge by sharing insights through interviews, practical tools for living well, encouragement, and courage for overcoming all from a Christian perspective. And now, here's your host, Pastor Brad Hafes. Hello, my friend, and welcome to this edition of Fresh Hope for Mental Health. I'm Brad Hafes, your host, and our purpose here on Fresh Hope for Mental Health is to empower you to live a faith-filled, rich, and full life in spite of having a mental health diagnosis. Well, today, my uh, guest is up early in the morning as we're recording this. It's five o'clock in the evening, my time, and it's 6 a.m. his time. And he's in uh, Singapore, if I remember right. And I have Nick Johnson with me. Hi, Nick. Great to have you. Hi, Brad. Thank you so much for having me. Indeed, it's a beautiful morning here in Singapore, and it's great to be with you. <laughs> this is the farthest away I've ever interviewed anyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry that you had to get up so early, but you're a good Swede, right? You like your coffee? Yes, I had my morning coffee, Brad, and also, and as you will hear today, I'm a, a quite an early riser. I found myself having good routines. I try to be up early in the morning for an exercise most days as well. Ah, yeah. I think, uh, what kind of exercise do you do? Um, well, you know, I, I myself is approaching 50, so I realize that just running is a bit hard on the body, so I try to mix it up a bit with also swimming, cycling, and uh, I also do like uh, walking. Great, great. Well, I found out about you through an email and uh, you've written a book. I want you to tell us about the book, but I also wanted you to tell us about what it is that you do and how you came to write the book, um, because you kind of specialize with executives. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Brett. Well, tell me, tell us what the name of the book is and what it's about and maybe how you came to really be passionate about this subject. Sure. And uh, Brad, uh, right as you said, I was born in Sweden and after that I had an international career. I lived in uh, Australia, Thailand, Vietnam, oh Indonesia, my. and now in Singapore working. And I worked for many of the big multinational companies in these countries. And what I could realize in management positions was that many times it was quite lonely. I felt quite isolated. Uh, perhaps I was most focused on my KPIs and goals and going to the top getting promotions, getting pay rises, instead of caring for my uh, friends and colleagues. And uh, uh, that can be quite lonely when you're trying to go to the top. And, uh, you know, you, many times do, people are doing the rat race, they think becoming a bit too selfish. And that, I found myself in that game as well. Um, then later on when I had a crash uh, mentally and I resigned from my work and so on, I was looking at the blank page and seeing what should I do. And that's now what I do. I work for the last seven years with support groups for senior executives, so they should have this support network outside of the work. And it's through these groups, Brad, where I listened also to and found out that I was not the only one who had those feelings of loneliness and isolation yes. while inside the jobs. Uh, and I wanted to make a difference. So what I did, I put out a survey in 2019 where I basically asked how, how they felt I also did a lot of interviews in 2019, and while the findings then actually were, were quite surprising um, and shocked me, uh, then came, of course, the pandemic around the corner, and I redid yeah. the survey and, and, and the interviews, and that I could compare these results. So that's the foundation for the book here, Brad. Yes, and, and what you found is... Uh executives tend to be lonely and uh, really have some mental health challenges themselves, right? And don't feel like they can talk about it. Is that right? Yes. So actually in 2019, I found that 30% of the executives uh, that I interviewed uh, either were or had been suffering of loneliness. Uh, during the pandemic, then this number, when everyone was then working remotely, 
had doubled. Uh, so that wow. just shows that you know people were suffering uh, more during this time in the workplaces. Um, I just want to say, but there was also one more reason why I wrote this book. Uh, in 2019, also there was another incident that happened, and sadly, I lost a friend and a, and a colleague in Singapore uh, due to suicide. And this was a gentleman who had just uh, been to Mount Everest Base Camp, who was living his dreams. He sh- shared on social media that he had never been more in love with his girlfriend. We thought he had it all together. Suddenly, he was gone. And wow. we were all just wondering, whatever happened here? And uh, so my book is also dedicated to him uh, because I realized that if we can just break down the loneliness and if we can talk to each other and if we have a good support network, uh, both personally and professionally, then these these incidents should never happen. Yeah. Well, and, you know, loneliness is really the symptom of isolating, of of being isolated, right? And um, that in and of itself gets you into your own head, thinking so much your own thoughts and uh, ruminating and, uh, yeah. And uh, so tell me what, what how did you crash you mentioned that you crashed tell me how how did you crash what happened for you that got you to the point where you realized all these things well uh in 2014 2015 i was in what perhaps many men call a 40 years crisis i believe if i should be humble and look back at it uh But I'm also diagnosed with bipolar, so I could go from, you know, overconfidence to silent and and separate myself and isolate myself. And uh, I think in 2014, I had extreme swings here. So when I was in overconfidence mode, I I divorced my wife, resigned from my job, and then eventually I found myself sitting there isolated and and lonely. Uh, So... Uh, with that, then I was trying to find some support, and instead of supporting myself through a network, which I do now, it was many times uh, also giving up exercise, going to the bar after work, and having a few drinks instead. And with that came also the wrong friends. So it was a downward yeah. spiral that creeped on me. And before I knew it, uh, I, I had given up most of my exercise and replaced it with alcohol, and I found myself extremely lonely. So this mm. was then in 2015. Yeah. I don't know if you know it, but I too have bipolar disorder. So, um, and I crashed and burned, uh, well, it's almost 27 years ago now, but yes. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm aware of some research. I don't have it right in front of me at the time of this recording, but there is a book out there also about how many top executives in the world have what's called hypomania, and many of them uh, never it never develops into uh, complete uh, mania, but they they live lives of hypomania. They can get a lot done. A lot of energy, um, little sleep, and um, I sometimes I wonder if the ratios aren't higher for bipolar disorder in particular, probably type one more so, um, in the executive uh, groups of people. Do, do you know anything about that, or it makes so much sense to me, uh, Brad? And, uh, if you can just, uh, uh, if someone had watched the movie also about uh, McDonald's, the founder, if you see, it's, it's one word that stands out that made McDonald's, they say it's persistence. And if you have hypermania and you keep being active and you lack sleep, you're going to achieve so much more than anyone else. And that is what I'm talking about when I said elbowing my way up, KPIs, goals yep. being driven. And that is what indeed many, many of the senior executives have this. And that just means that we achieve two, three times more as a normal human being in a day. Yeah. Well, I could go, uh, I would go and lock myself in a motel room for two or three days, not sleep, or maybe take an hour or two nap and come home with more work done than the other 20 some people on the staff would do in six months. You know, or I had ideas to keep us busy for two years, you know, and um, I loved that. But when it developed into mania, then it became dangerous. 
and it it became harmful to to me and to the others because then I couldn't stand to be around anybody who couldn't keep up with my thinking, and usually my thinking was not real clear, and you know, it, had, it didn't necessarily have direction. Tell me the name of your book. So the book is called Executive Loneliness, Brad, and I pinned the coin there because you know I I didn't want some terminology that was too, should I say, detailed into the mental health space that would yes. scare people away either. But uh, still, people are a little bit scared to pick up a book when you see it on the shelf called Executive Loneliness. But I also call it that because I want to break the stigma. Discussing mental health and discussing loneliness, you need to become familiar and make yourself friendly with the term if we want to talk about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, when did the book come out? It just re- recently, right? Uh, it was out uh, just over a year ago, Brad, okay. and it came out then when it was still uh, in the pandemic, and oh. the time was, of course, fantastic, and uh, it went uh, straight up to number one in men's health, mental health in the U.S., and uh, for, wow. only for a day, but at least it had a great launching, so I yeah. think yeah, certainly it was resonating with a lot of people. Yeah, now you mentioned men's mental health uh, um, there, yeah, well... I really believe, and, you know, I as a pastor uh, happen to be part of a denomination that only has men pastors, but I really think all of us men have issues with talking about our mental health stuff. We Absolutely, Brad. And, and, and after the book was out, and this was an era when still many people were doing online meetings, I was invited by various support groups also to talk about the book. Uh, Mentoring Men was one beautiful network in Australia who connected men uh. to just dial in on Zoom for one hour every Wednesday night where they were sharing basically uh, how they were feeling and so on. And these were new concepts. Uh, and these were many people living in very remote area. So during the pandemic, then they were completely isolated. And I was then the opening speaker uh, at this event, for example, just to set the scene to show that it's okay to be vulnerable. Because once I passed that message, it resonated with some, and then they could have a conversation afterwards. But that's almost how it is with men. We need to open up the conversation. Otherwise, all we're going to talk about is, you know, sports, uh, TV, uh, yep. The weather or uh, what beer we drink, the conversation is not going to go deeper. Yeah, they say like uh, women will go out for lunch and face each other and talk about their emotions and feelings of what's going on in their lives. And men, we go out and eat lunch, sit shoulder to shoulder and watch the game on TV while we're eating and talking to each other about the baseball game or the football game or the soccer game or whatever. And we never really get to the feelings. So, uh, tell me, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, tell me in your own recovery after being diagnosed with, did you know you had bipolar disorder prior to the crash or did you find out at that time and were there other things going on? I did not know it then and I did not know it uh, during the crash. It's only much later on. Uh, in when I was actually writing the book, when I was also speaking with a lot of therapists and in doing interviews of them, and they also did analysis of me, and uh, it was two independent therapists who came up with the same conclusions. Uh, so even though the first one I rejected, and then I, I was in denial, <laughs> and when the second one also gave me the same diagnosis, it was becoming quite obvious, so I, I, I had to face it. Uh, which was which is good. Once you face something, then it becomes your friend, and it's easier to move forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, w- what about the alcohol? You had mentioned that uh, you were going to the bar and the wrong friends, and you know what? How did that play out? Yeah. So in two thousand, I was still a bit lost in two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen. I was jumping from. Job to job, uh, sorting out my divorce case. I moved to a country because I felt didn't feel home at one country in Indonesia. So I moved back to Vietnam where I lived earlier. And uh, when I came back there, I didn't have a job at the start. So my only friend was the alcohol, going to the bar and seeing the friends there. Yeah, as we said, watching the sport, not having deeper conversations than that. And uh, uh, then it became too much. Um, it became too much, and I, I started to become a daily drinker. I drank uh, uh, to, to numb my emotions during this time, and 
Uh, also, I felt sorry for myself. The self pity kicked in and so on. And in 2018, I found myself that uh, you know I didn't enjoy drinking and I, I couldn't stop. Uh, I, I was certainly addicted. And luckily, though, at this time, I had uh, just remarried and. I did one thing that uh, probably saved my life at this stage and uh, it made me the person I am today. Uh, I told my new wife after three weeks of marriage how I felt internally and she had no idea. She thought I was this high achiever, had it all together. Yes, and uh, when I was uh, drinking or something, it was networking events, so it was to see people. She didn't know how I felt internally and what I'm sharing with you here today. And uh, she decided to listen, and she also brought me to a doctor. We also called up a common friend who had had an alcohol problem a few years earlier, and she very quickly introduced me to a support group, uh, an anonymous support group. I joined them, and uh, I had also, thanks to the doctor's support and this group, it was like a switch. Um, mm. And uh, so the second meeting I came in today, I haven't had a drink since, and that's now over four years ago, and that made a huge transformation in my life. Yeah, congratulations, congratulations. It takes a lot of courage to go to that first meeting, doesn't it? It does, Brad, and again, we are so, we're so scared and so much stigma surrounding this, but I'm also now, uh, that's why I want to talk about this today on this uh, call with you, Brad, because it's important that we realize that it, 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 it's okay to say that we had a problem. It's okay to say that we were pressured and uh, we gave up the exercise and we picked up the drink instead. It's e much easier to talk about it and address it if, if we are comfortable with it, and, and I'm a big advocate of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to talk about it is to begin to work through it uh, and, and work... Um, to process the pain and to process what's going on within us, you know, and that, to process those things, one has to talk. <laughs> you have to talk. And, you know, many of us try to do it inside of ourselves. And, you know, we weren't created that way. Uh, when God made us, he made us for relationships. And I find that, um, uh, like our mental health support groups, I find amazing things happen when people just interact with each other and they share with each other and they can give each other insights and things that worked for them that you wouldn't get otherwise. Yes, absolutely. And that's what, uh, what the support groups is all about. And you know uh, all this too well also, Brad. And that's why now I make sure I have both personal uh, support groups are still supported the uh, anonymous group here with uh, with alcohol addiction and I keep supporting newcomers who have problems I'm on a roster also and I will have the 24-hour uh, hotline coming up here in October I will oh, have wow. it for two weeks and then take calls from people who are dialing in who have problems questions and so on so they can call in you know and, and ask questions um, and that's my way of giving back and we say in this group we say uh, you have to give it back to keep it, and that is the gift I've been given. Yes, yeah. Well, now, you, if I understand correct, understood you correctly earlier, you have you run some support groups or facilitate for sort uh, facilitate support groups for executives uh, that are just going and dealing with just being an executive, right? That's correct, Brad. So they are more about the operational challenges that you are facing. We have here in Singapore now, I'm running 21 of these support groups. Oh it can be, uh, you know, for sustainability leaders. It can be for supply chain leaders. So it's the, the uh, separator like that where they can come together then to discuss the work-related challenges because the pressures they are under at work, who do you bring them to? You cannot really bring it home to your spouse or partner at home and discuss it. They might know your, not know your industry or the problems you're facing. And you don't cannot talk to your colleagues, perhaps, and your boss is the one who's pushing you. So what do you do right. with those pressures? You have to keep it inside or talk about it. And that's what we do. We facilitate it in a, in a confidential environment. Now, are they all in person or do you have some in online? Uh, so uh, they are in person. I've been in person for one year now. Uh, we, of course, during the uh, lockdowns, we had to take it online, but it was not so easy. It was not a deep and meaningful conversation. And our meetings are also half a day. 
so to sit half a day in an online meeting to talk uh, something deep and challenging is not so easy. Yeah, yeah, I find that to be the case. Um, it, it works, but it doesn't work quite as well. <laughs> But um, so That's now, right. if people want to get to know more about you and the work that you're doing, how can they find you? Um, and also, I'm assuming we can pick up the book um, Executive Loneliness online. Uh, I'm assuming Amazon. And is it available other places? Yes, so uh, my book is certainly available on Amazon, um, and you can just search for Executive Loneliness on Amazon. It's also on Audible, because what many executives said, well, I, I like to listen when I'm traveling, walking, or jogging or something, so it's on Audible by request. Uh, uh, you can also find it on Google and Apple Books, so... Yeah, that, that's where the book is available, and through that, of course, people find me. But otherwise, but I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So if uh, an executive is listening, you can look into the LinkedIn network, and there you look up Nick Johnson, and that's spelled N-I-C-K-J-O-N-S-S-O-N. Yes, yeah, and they can find you on LinkedIn. Boy, isn't that something. Um, tell me what... Um, you found, um, give me uh, like three major insights that you um, found with your book and with the research. Yes, sure. I think uh, the first insight we, I shared uh, was obviously the, the loneliness, the first 30% in 2019 and then doubled during the pandemic. But what I can say just to add to this is that I found also that 84% of the executives would not discuss their mental health challenges with their company. So that means they would not talk to the HR or the boss about their mental health challenges. Yeah. The reason being, when you push them and ask deeper, Brad, is that because they're scared that maybe I won't get the next promotion, maybe that this would be negative for my performance. So yes. that's quite shocking, isn't it? Yes, but it's in one sense, it's so shocking and it's sad. But on the other hand, I understand why they don't, because uh, there's so much stigma. And then a boss can make de decisions based upon, well, that's not getting done. So this is why or it. it yeah, it's it's too bad that we don't live without that stigma because they wouldn't they would not hide if they had a broken leg or if they were That's having right. kidney dysfunctions, you know. <laughs> but a broken brain, we yeah. don't talk about. Yeah. And I have one more finding also that I did. From my research, I found, and this was uh, from the Mental Health Foundation in the UK, also in 2019, they did a similar study. They also found that 75% of people actually don't seek help for mental health issues. So that's related to what you say. So if you have a broken arm, you certainly are going to see a doctor. But if you have mental health issues, 75% will not go and ask for help. Isn't that something? Yeah. And and most mental health issues do not get better on their own. Uh, you know, it, it usually then it's going to lead to some kind of situation in life that's going to cause even more pain. Um, whether that's through, you know, self-medicating or, um, you know, inappropriate behavior or just bizarre behavior or whatever. I, I was on uh, our state's um, advisory committee to the governor for mental health, and I it dawned on me during the one of the meetings, here I am, a 60-some-year-old man, and I'm going, oh, that's why they call it behavioral health, because when you have mental health issues – it comes out in your behavior. <laughs> and I thought, duh, I'd never thought of that before. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's a lot like our vision. If you don't get it corrected, your eyes just keep getting worse and they get worse faster without glasses, without correction. And um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, and, and the only way to break the stigma down is for men like yourself or me to, to say, hey, men, it's okay that you, you can't 
You can't will yourself out of clinical depression. You and I can't will ourselves out of bipolar disorder any more than we could if we had stage four cancer. You know, you take the treatments, you do what you need to do, and, and you keep pushing forward. Of course, there's some will involved in it, but yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I agree, Brandon. The only way here is to talk about it and get out of our own head. And we do that by not, I mean, just talking to each other. So thank you for uh, driving this dialogue, Brandon, uh, forward as well. Yeah, well, I want to encourage any of you who are listening, um, and many of you are in other countries or wherever, maybe you know an executive. Maybe you are one. Um, maybe you feel lonely. And uh, I would encourage men to get a hold of this book. Um, but it could be women, buy the book, give it to your husband. Um, you know, and I would encourage those of you um, who are in a church, uh, many of our listeners are Christians. And um, if you have a pastor, um, I would encourage you to get this book for your pastor because pastors experience much of the same thing that executives do. It's lonely, and they're isolated, and they are afraid to talk to uh, not just anybody, including their spouse, about, you know, here we're supposed to be people of faith, and maybe we're having doubts or struggling with loneliness and depression. And so get this book for them. And um you know, soon you'll hear more about the Fresh Hope groups that we're starting for pastors, and it's going to be kind of very much like what Nick is doing with the executives, where it, you know, you need to be around people that understand you, get you, are in the same business, if you will. Yep, yeah. So, Nick, uh, if you would just what would you say to anybody who's listening to this day um, as we as we close to really say to them words of encouragement? What would you say? They're, they, they've they crashed, um, and maybe the crash is still happening or it's just about to happen. What would you say to them today? Well, th- th- there's only one thing that I'd say, Brian, and it's really to talk about it. If you have some feelings on your mind, just think about who can I share with this with. Is it a friend? Is it a colleague? Is there someone out there who you can just share this, what's on your mind with? If you cannot think of someone, go into Google and search for some support group. There's so many beautiful volunteer organizations uh, and hotlines which are free. They support groups for almost everything these days, and it doesn't matter what addiction, what issue it is. Go in and search it and just pick up the phone and, and call and just open up your mouth and say, the half the problem in all souls within the first 10 seconds of just speaking there. Yeah, I agree. And there, and you'll find out you're not alone and that there is hope and there's healing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would suspect, Nick, you would say you're living your best life now. Yes, I am indeed. And uh, this is what I'm sharing also in my book, Brad. It's not only about getting well, it's about living a dream that is worth living as well. And uh, actually, my last chapter in the book, which I will not reveal too much about today, but it's about finding a purpose, and it's very much related to the work you do as a pastor as well. It's about then as an executive, many times perhaps they will have too much ego, be too much of themselves, and it's about asking yourself, is it something bigger out there? Uh, Is it some power which is greater than myself? And Mm. it's about finding that, and that is really what takes you to the next level. Wow. That's that's cool. I need to get a copy of that book, and um, I I need to stay in touch with you because um, you might be able to help us even with what we're doing with pastors and um, yeah. So thank you so much. I'm glad you got a hold of us through um, your person, and uh, that we were able to do this. And uh, again, um, executive loneliness. Pick it up on Amazon. And thank you so much for being here today, Nick. I really appreciate your time, especially while well, you've got the data face. I'm getting ready to go to bed later. 
uh, just is so crazy to me. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much, mm -hmm. and and blessings to you and your work. Thank you so much, Brad. You have a good evening. Thank you. Well, my friends, that's another edition of Fresh Hope for Mental Health. As you can guess, you can find us in all the places of social media and all those kinds of things. And we'd love to connect with you. Maybe you have some comments or questions. You could always email me at pastorbrad at freshhope.us. I read my own emails and we'll answer you or we'll take you up on the topic that you'd like to hear about. We have videos and uh, all kinds of things on YouTube and uh, Facebook Live programs. In fact, we now have a program every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Central Time Zone. So I don't know what that would be in Nick's time zone, but <laughs> maybe 8 o'clock in the morning. Huh? And um, it, it's 7 o'clock on um, Thursday night, Central Time Zone, and it's called Living Well. And you can find that on our uh, Fresh Hope for Mental Health page on uh, Facebook. And then if you would do me a favor, leave a um, your review of if you're watching this on iTunes or listening to this on iTunes, just fill out a, an honest review. It just helps other people find the podcast. Be sure and tell your friends about the program. And um, until the next time, my friends, may the Lord hold you with his perfect hope. And just if you're going through hell, don't stop. Just keep taking one step forward. And like Nick said today, Google. Google help. There's all kinds of help available. We'd love to help you in any way, shape, or form we can with Fresh Hope. Just let us know. We have groups all over the world as well as we have groups online. So... Anyway, God bless you. Until next time, I'm Brad Hafes, your host. This has been Fresh Hope for Mental Health. You've been listening to Fresh Hope for Mental Health. If you have an opportunity, please review, share, and subscribe to the Fresh Hope for Mental Health podcast on iTunes or on the service that you use. We encourage you to share our podcast on social media with your friends and family. Previous podcasts of Fresh Hope for Mental Health can be found at freshhopeformentalhealth.com, iHeartRadio, Stitcher Radio, and iTunes. Fresh Hope is one of the leading networks of faith-based peer support groups internationally. For more information about Fresh Hope, go to freshhope.us.